She's also a supporter of legislation that came out of this committee called the Syria Freedom Support Act, not yet considered by the full House. Mr. Chabot, thanks for being here this morning. Thank you, Susan. We're going to take you now to today's session of the House of Representatives. They're just gaveling into session, and uh, there is a vote on spending bill on energy and water department and related agencies. We pause now in your presence and acknowledge our dependence on you. We ask your blessing upon the men and women of this, the People's House. Keep them aware of your presence as they face the tasks of this day, that no burden be too heavy, no duty too difficult, and no work too wearisome. Help them, and indeed help us all to obey your law, to do your will, and to walk in your way. Grant that they might be good in thought, gracious in word, generous in deed, and great in spirit. Make this a glorious day in which all are glad to be alive, eager to work, and ready to serve you, our great nation, and all our fellow brothers and sisters. May all that is done this day be done for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House's approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. The Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Chair will entertain up to five one-minute requests on each side. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York rise? To address the House for one minute. Does the gentleman ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute? Yes, unanimous consent, and I also ask unanimous consent to revise the motion. Without objection. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, over the last district work period, my colleague Paul Tonko and I hosted a conference to bring focus for better prevention, testing, treatment, and insurance coverage for victims of Lyme and associated tick-borne diseases. This conference was constituent-driven. Over the past couple of years, I've heard from hundreds of constituents who were suffering from Lyme or who had family members or close friends suffering from this disease. Two of these constituents took the lead and organized this conference, Christina Fisk and Holly Ahern. They did a terrific job. We had a dynamic keynote speaker, experts on the scope and the economic burden of Lyme, and a very encouraging presentation by Dr. Horowitz on a new approach for diagnosis and treatment that identifies co-infections and other environmental hazards as the cause for chronic Lyme symptoms. This approach could potentially unite the medical community presently divided over whether chronic Lyme exists. We also received briefings on supporting doctors who treat chronic Lyme patients, protecting the blood supply, new approaches to testing, and a dynamic summary by Dr. Leigner that provides a comprehensive roadmap for the way ahead. Last year, I was proud to support $8.75 million increase for better testing and reporting of Lyme, but much more needs to be done. I'm submitting for the record our conference materials, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on this vital public health issue. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman from Vermont rise? Gentleman is recognized for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The other day I received a letter from a constituent, Lena Kunkel. Like many Vermonters, she's concerned about the doubling of Stafford student loan interest rates scheduled for July 1. This is very personal for her. She used the Stafford loan to get a good education and start a career as a nurse. She's now a, a contributing member of the community. She's also the granddaughter of former U.S. Vermont Representative and Senator Bob Stafford, for whom the Stafford Student Loan Program is named. Here's what she had to say about her grandfather. I know my grandfather's intention for these loans was accessibility and not profit. I understand the times are tough and people are looking everywhere, but this is just not right. My grandfather was known as a gentle giant, but if he were alive today, I think he would oppose this with force. Mr. Speaker, Bob Stafford knew that higher education was the clearest path to the middle class in this country, and he was a good Republican. We should not let the interest rates double. There's no justification to having these interest rates go from 3.4 to 6.8 percent. We have 30 days to act. I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one minute. 
Mr. Speaker, the USDA Bio-Based Markets Program was created to provide new markets for farm commodities and encourage consumers to purchase environmentally friendly bio-based products. Unfortunately, under the current law, most forest products are excluded from both the federal procurement preference and the market label of the USDA Bio-Based Market Program. For instance, bamboo plywood is already eligible for the bio-preferred labels and is used as a green alternative for hardwood flooring or lumber. The Forest Products Fairness Act of 2012 modifies the definition of bio-based products to clarify that forest products should be included in the bio-based markets program if they meet the minimum bio-based content requirements. The Forest Products Fairness Act of 2012 will enable U.S. producers to build back a competitive advantage through stronger, expanded product markets and new economic opportunities so that the industry can better compete in the global marketplace. Including U.S.-made forest products as part of USDA's BioPreferred program is a win-win for consumers and producers. It will promote healthy, well-managed forests and the protection of communities that rely on these jobs and industries to survive. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut rise? The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 29 days, the interest rate for the Stafford Student Loan Program is going to increase from 3.4 percent to 6.8 percent. This will add thousands of dollars of additional debt costs for middle-class students all across America. Yesterday, the Christian Science Monitor reported that Speaker Boehner called this issue a phony issue and a distraction from the real issues. There is nothing phony about adding thousands of dollars of added debt to middle class students. There is nothing phony about the Federal Reserve Board report that came out yesterday that showed that student loan debt increased by $30 billion in the first quarter of this year, surpassing credit card debt. The only thing, frankly, that is a pretense around here is the work schedule. In this week, only one full day, two part-time days, and 40 days for the next five months. It is time for us to get to work in this chamber and fix problems like the Stafford student loan interest rate. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Speaker, I have the consent to uh, uh, present a one-minute speech to the House and revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, Recent Memorial Weekend and now the ever-escalating uh, high unemployment numbers uh, remind us of how many veterans are out of work, how many returning home uh, that will be returning home to no jobs. For the last year, I've worked on the Veteran Skills to Jobs Act, something that uh, when I left the active duty military, I realized that it would take me several years to, uh, to get the credentialing in the civilian side that I already had on the military side. We have the, the best, most sophisticated, trained uh, workforce in the military. As they return home, we need to make sure that not only do we, they have jobs, but they have high-paying, skilled jobs. By credentialing them on the uh, Department of Defense before they get uh, discharged, we give them the opportunity to capture those jobs immediately. When I introduced this bill uh, several weeks later, the Senate uh, introduced a companion bill, and now today the President uh, has declared his support for the bill. It is time to show leadership in both houses, show leadership in the presidency, and pass this bill. Our brave men and women that have served so bravely and sacrificed so much deserve jobs when they get home, high-paying jobs that will allow them to get back into our society. Thank you very much. I yield back. Jim yields back his time. What purpose does a gentleman from New Jersey rise? The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Americans are growing more and more cynical of politics and politicians with good reason. Citizens United opened the floodgates to unrestricted special interest campaign spending in elections. And we need to put an end to the influence of secret money in our elections. I advocate the Disclose Act. It would shine the light on secret money in political campaigns. The Disclose Act requires public reporting by super PACs, corporations, unions, and outside groups within 24 hours of making a campaign expenditure or transferring funds of $10,000 or more to other groups for campaign-related activities. Mr. Speaker, I tell you, when I'm, on the camp, when I'm on the trail and I talk to my constituents, everyone is outraged by the millions and possibly billions of dollars that are going to be spent on the presidential, congressional, Senate campaigns. It makes sense to have some transparency. We should pass the Disclose Act so that at least those who make these contributions have to say who they are. It's only fair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
For what purpose is the gentlelady from Tennessee seek recognition? Request unanimous consent to address the House to one minute to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, as one of the most outspoken opponents of Obamacare, I hope in the upcoming weeks that the Supreme Court strikes down this disastrous piece of legislation. But the fact is, no matter what the Supreme Court decides about Obamacare, it does not change the reality that this law is horrible policy. That is why I have voted more than two dozen times to either defund or repeal Obamacare since being elected to Congress. Yesterday, in the House Ways and Means markup, we successfully passed out of committee two bills that would repeal the Obamacare tax hikes. One, the medical tax device, and, the, and number two, the medicine cabinet tax. It is clear that the House must continue to fight against Obamacare until either the Supreme Court overturns this law in its entirety or until we have willing partners in the Senate and the White House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Question unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to celebrate the life of a friend and someone who changed the lives of victims throughout the nation. Suzanne McDaniel appeared in my court years ago as one of the first prosecutor-based victim assistant directors in the state of Texas. She went on to start the Texas Crime Victims Clearinghouse, the first of its kind anywhere in the United States. In recognition for her incredible work, she was tapped as the state's crime victim information officer, educating and influencing the community and the state legislature with her vast knowledge of victims' issues. This led to her role as a legislative liaison for the state coalition of victim organizations and her leadership on the board of the National Organization of Victim Assistance. Suzanne's accomplishments are far-reaching, touching lives in Texas and throughout our nation. A crime victor wrote, quote, Suzanne feels everyone is important and needed in, in the fight to improve assistance for crime victims. I have never heard her say it's not my job. In fact, she has never been shy about poking her nose into things and offering assistance. Her enthusiasm and dedication is boundless. Mr. Speaker, her work will continue to touch crime victims for many years to come. And victims are safer in America because of Suzanne McDaniel and her life. I yield back the balance of my time, and that's just the way it is. Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I present a privileged report for printing under the rule. The clerk will report the title. Report to accompany H.R. 5882, a bill making appropriations for the legislative branch for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2013, and for other purposes. Refer to the union calendar and order printed. Pursuant to clause, rule, clause 1 of Rule 21, points of order are reserved. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the further consideration of H.R. 5325 that, may I have, that I may include tabular material on the same. Without objection. <clears throat> Pursuant to House Resolution 667 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration of H.R. 5325. Will the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, kindly take the chair?
The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration of H.R. 5325, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill making appropriations for energy and water development and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013, and for other purposes. When the Committee of the Whole House rose on Thursday, May 31st, 2012, all time for general debate has expired. Pursuant to the rule, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. During consideration of the bill for amendment, the chair may accord priority in recognition to a member offering an amendment who has caused it to be printed in the designated place in the congressional record. Those amendments will be considered read. The clerk will read. Be it enacted, the following sums are appropriated for fiscal year 2013, namely, Title I, Corps of Engineers, Civil Department of the Navy, Corps of Engineers, Civil. Appropriations shall be authorized functions for pertaining to river and harbor, flood and storm damage reduction and related efforts. Investigations, $102 million. Construction, $1,477,284,000. What purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Scalise of Louisiana, page 3, line 16, after the dollar amount insert increased by $10 million. Page 28, line 16, after the dollar amount insert reduced by $10 million. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to present this amendment. And what we're doing is we're transferring $10 million from the Department of Energy's salary and expenses account over to the Corps of Engineers construction account. And the reason this is critical is because it allows us to move forward on infrastructure improvements, including in Louisiana, something that we've been trying to do to restore our coast and get moving on the Louisiana coastal area, uh, which is one of many projects in the Corps' budget that are backlogged and not funded, uh, and yet are critical for improving infrastructure, for creating jobs, uh, for doing things to protect our wetlands. And uh, of course in Louisiana, I bring this football because we lose one football field of land every hour along the Gulf Coast in Louisiana due to coastal erosion. And we have a plan that we put forth. Our Governor Bobby Jindal and his team have a solid plan in place that they've moved forward on. And what we're trying to do, this is an authorized program, uh, we're just trying to make sure that this program can move forward like so many others across the country that would improve our waterways, that would strengthen our coastlines. Uh, and yet, you've got salaries that are being funded for projects now, and, and you look at the Department of Energy, we've actually cut back on a lot of the work that they do at the Department of Energy, rightfully so, eliminating programs that are unnecessary, uh, and yet their salaries still continue to go up. Uh, so they're doing, you know, we ask people to do more with less. In this case, they're doing less with more. And so we're moving money out of a salaries account for people that are doing less work and moving it into actually doing coastal projects, actually doing work uh, that improves our coast and strengthens uh, the, the areas that protect the vital infrastructure for the oil and gas industry that feeds this nation's energy needs and the seafood that feeds this nation's great, great taste for great things like shrimp and oysters and crabs. And so with that, I reserve the balance of my time. I'll reserve the balance of his time. Okay, then I would like can, uh, to yield uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Louisiana. Uh, this is a bipartisan amendment, and I want to, uh, want to thank the gentleman from Louisiana for uh, helping us with this, Mr. Richmond from New Orleans. Uh, the gentleman from Louisiana may yield, but may not yield blocks of time. Thank you. Yield. Does the gentleman yield? Yield to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you to uh, my colleague from Louisiana. And we have the great honor and awesome responsibility of representing uh, the coast of Louisiana. And Mr. Chairman, the coast of Louisiana over uh, since 1950 has sent to the American Treasury almost $150 billion. And up until 2006, we didn't receive any uh, revenues back from the federal government uh, for drilling off of our outer continental shelf. Uh, what we do today is just ask for the ability to help ourselves, protect our citizens, and make this country safer. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I'd like to remind the chair that our state has over 40% of the nation's wetland losses, but 
we have uh, 80 percent of wetland lost, but we only have 40 percent of the nation's wetlands. But if you look at what we give back to this country, I think that you will see that a $10 million investment uh, would be a very good uh, investment into our country, into our state, uh, if you look at the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, our wetlands produce a third of the nation's seafood supply and much of our domestic energy. Our coast is the home to the, port, the country's largest port system. These ports move overwhelm, oh, the overwhelming majority of our imports and exports in this country. It's not just about uh, the oil and gas production. It's not just about Louisiana's importance in terms of our energy production for this country, but it also makes the residents of Louisiana safer. Those coastal, uh, that coastal land and those barrier islands produce the first defense to hurricanes. And we all saw during Hurricane Katrina uh, the devastation that could be caused. So we're just asking uh, this body to approve this amendment which will help Louisiana protect our citizens, protect America's uh, energy production. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield the balance of the time back to the gentleman from Louisiana. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague from Louisiana for his comments, and I just urge all of our colleagues to vote for this amendment uh, so that we can actually use money to do real projects instead of to fund the bureaucracy of Washington, uh, and, and especially when we're actually reducing the workload that they have to do. Let's actually shift that money over to an area where we can actually increase jobs, protect our nation, protect our energy and infrastructure that benefits the entire country. And with that, I would urge passage of this amendment. I'd yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Mr. Chairman, I must rise in opposition to the amendment, uh, but I do appreciate uh, the gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment, and I do appreciate the passion of both of these gentlemen for coastal restoration. Uh, I know it's a high priority for his district and his state, and, and of course the focus is Louisiana, and they've suffered greatly. The bill before us includes $10 million to continue studies, engineering, des and design work on various components uh, of their program in Louisiana. That is more than 9 percent of the entire investigations account dedicated to continuing work on coastal restoration in Louisiana. The committee has had to make some tough choices in this bill, though, and while overall funding for the Corps of Engineers has increased slightly above the President's request, unfortunately it is reduced by 4 percent from fiscal year 2012. The construction account specifically is also slightly above the President's budget request, but that is still a reduction of almost 13 percent from fiscal year 2012. The Corps has numerous projects already under construction that were not included in the President's budget and so are unlikely to be funded in, in fiscal year 2013. While construction funding is trending downward, I believe it is most prudent to prioritize funding for ongoing projects so they can be completed, actually completed, and the federal government can realize the public safety, economic, and other benefits from previous spending rather than starting new projects. And given that this particular project has currently authorized approaches $2 billion and likely will continue to grow in cost, it would not be prudent to begin another major new project while we have so many existing commitments. For these reasons, I must oppose the amendment and urge my colleagues to vote no on it. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman may not reserve. Okay. Does gentleman yield? Yale, be yeah, back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from uh, Indiana, Our seek Chairman, recognition. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I appreciate the recognition and uh, rise uh, to first of all express to my colleague and friend from Louisiana uh, my appreciation uh, for his uh, argument today and particularly the football analogy that he used. Uh, I say that as a Notre Dame graduate, uh, and I would congratulate him on his victory the last time our two teams played uh, on the field. Having said that, uh, however, uh, both he and my colleague on the Democratic side, uh, I joined the chairman in reluctant uh, opposition uh, to the amendment. Uh, the chairman has uh, opted for a policy of no new starts, a policy that I strongly support 
and have opted for during these times of budgetary constraints. Would point out uh, that while there is only $10 million in the amendment to before the House today, uh, the fact is this project will cost several billion dollars by the time we are done. And starting it now is a cost that we cannot afford to adequately fund uh, because we do not have the resources in the bill. Over the last several years, we have, in fact, terminated hundreds of ongoing projects uh, to our great dismay and to the weakening of the infrastructure of our economy in this country. But until we as an institution, the Congress, have the intestinal fortitude to adequately fund our infrastructure in these types of very necessary investment, that is not the argument before us, uh, I cannot support adding to the inventory of projects that we must start but cannot. If the allocation for the bill were different, I might be able to support the, the gentleman's amendment, but again, as it now stands, uh, we are short cash. And the fact is, the amounts in the bill today, and the chairman and I and every member of the subcommittee fought to add $81 million to the president's request. Uh, we are $631 million today in this bill below what we were spending as a nation on these projects two years ago. We don't have the money, unfortunately, to fund the gentleman's amendment uh, and therefore, again, uh, express my sincere appreciation for what he wants to do, but my reluctant opposition to his amendment, and I would yield back. Jimmy yields back. Question is on the amendment offered from the, by the gentleman from Louisiana. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask for a record vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Louisiana will be postponed. What purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Holt of New Jersey, page 3, line 16, after the dollar amount, insert increase by $2 million. Page 7, line 4, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $2 million. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the 2012 Atlantic hurricane season officially begins. And so I come to the floor to speak for increased resources to prevent flood damage as they have devastated our communities in New Jersey and around the eastern United States. Uh, in H.R. 5325, Chairman Friedenheisen and the committee have provided for the U.S. Corps of Engineers $1.5 billion for planning, training, and other measures to ensure the readiness of the Corps to respond to floods, hurricanes, and other natural disasters. And I thank the Chairman and the Committee for that work. This amount is a couple hundred million dollars below the amount that the Corps received for, for flood preparation in 2012. The amendment, my amendment, would provide an additional two million so the Corps can continue critical life-saving flood preparation work. Although this won't close the funding gap, my amendment would demonstrate the commitment of Congress to addressing proactively the variety of problems that can result from severe weather events and flooding. Last August and September, many central New Jersey residents experienced flood damage due to Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee. Evacuations and property damage can be a heavy burden to bear for many constituents. In recent years, there have been deaths in New Jersey from such flooding. I was traveling through my district during and after last, uh, last year's hurricane and saw firsthand the flooding damage uh, in the Delaware and Raritan River basins and elsewhere. 
When Hurricane Irene hit New Jersey last year, it cast more than 10,000 people from their homes and left more than 190,000 utility customers without power. Eleven inland rivers and their tributaries crested, some at record levels. The best time to address flooding is before the severe weather occurs. Unfortunately, it seems that severe weather events like floods and droughts will become only more common as the Earth's temperature continues to rise. There are a number of critical infrastructure and public works projects throughout central New Jersey that the Corps is at work on, that the Corps is aware of, that the Corps is planning to deal with. And they must continue in order to prepare for these severe weather events. Again, I appreciate the foresight and the wisdom of Chairman Friedenheisen. Um, this amendment would provide additional funds and incentive to the Corps of, to continue with these important projects. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I, I understand the gentleman, my colleague from New Jersey, is trying to show support for the Army Corps of Engineers construction <laughs> program. He's been a longtime advocate for projects important to his district, and, and I commend him for that. And I agree with him with his desire to invest more in water resources infrastructure. There have been numerous flood control needs for instance, across the entire country, including uh, our home state of New Jersey, experience has shown us that it's cheaper to try to prevent flood damages than trying to re recover from them. Although I believe the underlying bill that we put together, Mr. Vosklowski and I, struck a careful balance among our all priorities in the bill, including national security and energy innovation, uh, I do not have any objection uh, to his amendment, and uh, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Indiana. Uh, Chairman, moved to strike the last word and withdrawing the chair and supporting the amendment. Uh, Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. That uh, the Corps' investment uh, in 2010 alone uh, protected infrastructure in this country and prevented uh, over $28 billion worth of damages. The amendment is a modest one and it is spread across all of the accounts for a 0.14 percent increase. As the chairman noted, he worked very vigorously to increase the amounts in this account over the president's request by $6 million, but we remain $217 million below last year's level. So again, I would join the chair in supporting the amendment and will yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New Jersey. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. What purpose does the gentleman from Iowa rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk designated King 315. The, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. King of Iowa, page 3, line 16, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $1 million. Page 5, line 1, after the dollar amount, insert increased by 571 million four hundred twenty nine thousand five hundred seventy one thousand four hundred twenty four dollars gentleman from Iowa is recognized for five minutes thank you mr. chairman mr. chairman I offer this amendment uh, which what it does is it it strikes a, a million dollars out of the fish and wildlife account and it and it inserts five hundred and seventy one thousand four hundred and twenty nine into the uh, Missouri River maintenance account and so it is a net savings of 428571 which would go to deficit reduction. But my purpose is not to focus on the deficit reduction component of this, Mr. Chairman. My purpose is to make the statement that this, that we have watched in that Missouri River system, the Pick Sloan system that has, it has six dams upstream and the, long cha the longest channel in the United States going downstream. And we suffered a flood last summer, the 2011 flood, of epic proportions. The system had been designed and, and, and completed in 1968 based upon the largest runoff ever, which was 1881. Now it's 2011. Now the Corps of Engineers declares that, the, that last year's flood was a 500-year event. USGS says it's a, between a 70 and a 1,000 year event. The Corps picked the 500 year event, which defines it as an anomaly for them. 
and they refuse to uh, manage the river in a fashion that protects us from serious downstream flooding. So, instead of creating well, some uh, creating habitat for fish and wildlife, which is the least turn, the piping plover, and the pallid sturgeon, now we have hundreds of miles of camel habitat, sand and dead trees from the flooding. I have a bill, H.R. 2942, that needs to move through this Congress. This is an opportunity to speak to the necessity to direct the Corps of Engineers to protect us from serious downstream flooding and consider fish and wildlife in the interests upstream. This redirects some of those funds to that to send a message to the Corps of Engineers to take a little bit out of their fish and wildlife account, which is around $70 million and put a little bit into their maintenance account, which is around $7 million, and start to adjust this proportion. But it is a token vote, uh, Mr. Chairman, because there's much more that needs to be done. We need to be able to discharge 120,000 cubic feet per second out of Gavin's Point Dam and be able to maintain that within the channel. If we can do that, then the fisheries interests upstream have a very minimal impact when the Corps is finally, under H.R. 2942, directed to adjust the levels to protect us from serious downstream flooding. That is the argument. I urge the adoption of this amendment, the message that would be sent, and I would yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Iowa yields back his time. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Uh, a move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, commend the gentleman from Iowa for his strong advocacy and passion for uh, his district and his state and his constituents. He's uh, first and foremost uh, very, very concerned about a critical issue. Uh, we all know that there are significant uh, water resources needs across our country and we're doing our best in our bill to address them responsibly. The clarification I'd like to make is, is that the amendment simply adjusts overall account numbers. It does not direct funding to any specific project. I would advise respectfully uh, the gentleman and any of our other colleagues thinking of offering similar amendments, and we understand why people do, because they have a passion, that under the earmark ban, the final bill will not include funding uh, towards specific projects in an amount above the President's budget request. Instead of listing specific projects, our bill includes additional funding for categories of ongoing projects, primarily navigation and flood control. Final project-specific allocations will be made by the Administration following the enactment of our bill. Uh, with that clarification in mind, I'm pleased to support the, the gentleman's amendment. And uh, yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Indiana. Uh, Chairman, move to strike the last word. Gentleman from Indiana is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, while I regret that, uh, we Thank just you. received a copy of the gentleman's amendment while he was speaking. Uh, I have no objection to it and would yield back my time. Okay. Gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Iowa. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed Mr. Chairman, to. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Mr. Chairman, I, I request the yeas and nays. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Iowa will be postponed. Okay. The gentleman from Iowa is recognized. What purpose Mr. Chairman, I yield. I would uh, not offer the Second Amendment. All right. Thank you. Who seeks recognition? Clerk will read. Page 4, line 5. Mississippi River and Tributaries, $224 million. Operation and Maintenance, $2,507,409,000. Regulatory Reform, $190 million to remain available until September 30, 2014. Formerly Utilized Sites Remedial Action Program, $104 million. Flood Control and Coastal Emergencies, $27 million. Clerk will suspend. What purpose does the gentleman from Missouri rise? I have an amendment at the floor. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Cleaver of Missouri, page 6, line 18, after the dollar amount insert increased by $3 million. Page 7, line 4, after the dollar amount insert reduced by $3 million. The gentleman from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. 
Mr. Chairman, I rise today to offer an amendment to bolster the Army Corps of Engineers' ability to fight floods and to quickly begin repair efforts as the floodwaters recede. Last year, my constituents, as well as thousands of others living along the Missouri River, experienced a flood of historic proportions and catastrophic damages. Levees were over, overtopped or breached, fields were damaged, and hundreds of farmers, homeowners, and businesses had to evacuate. Over 400,000 acres of farmland were flooded along the river, including approximately 207,000 in Missouri. Total repair costs from the flood are estimated to reach $2 billion. The Flood Control and Coastal Emergency Account provides funding to assist in the immediate flood fighting efforts and the repairs. Historically, Congress has provided limited funding annually for this account, mainly relying on supplemental appropriations as emergencies arise. Funding for this account the last two years has been lower than the five-year average appropriation of $55 million. As was the case last year, after an emergency, the Corps must wait on supplemental appropriations from Congress, or they must transfer funds from existing appropriations for temporary emergency efforts. The Corps did this internal transfer last year during and after the 2011 flood. However, it takes time to transfer those funds and temporarily de deprives other worthy projects of funding. This is especially burdensome given the Corps' long construction backlog of over $62 billion worth of projects. This amendment is a straight transfer of funds to increase funding for the Corps' flood control and coastal emergency account and, in turn, reduce funding for the Corps' expense account. This transfer would increase the funding to equal the amount of that in the Senate Appropriations Committee and that which they have allowed, bringing total funding for that account to $30 million for fiscal year 2013. Mr. Chairman, ensuring adequate and annual funding for emergencies will better prepare the Corps to respond and save time and effort in trying to reroute funds. And we all know that emergencies will continue to occur as our climate changes and development countries uh, are still moving into flood-prone areas. It is incumbent upon us to provide the people who respond to these emergencies with the most resources possible. And so on behalf of the families living along the Missouri River who are in desperate need of help from this body, I ask for your support by adopting this amendment. Does the gentleman yield back? I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? I move to take the last word. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of this amendment. Let me assure the gentleman that uh, we are very sympathetic to his concern for fixing the infrastructure that was damaged in last year's flood event. In fact, we provided $1.7 billion to the Corps of Engineers for that exact, exact purpose. The issue the gentleman raises, however, is something all members need to be aware of. Based on the definitions of last year's amendments to the Budget Control Act, disaster funds uh, may only be used in locations declared dis major disasters under the Stafford Act. For some agencies, like FEMA, that may make sense, but for the Corps of Engineers, there are times when that definition is too restrictive. We all need to be aware of the potential consequences of forcing regular appropriations to the account for these disaster-related damages that happen to be in the wrong location according to the Budget Control Act. That notwithstanding, the gentleman's amendment would try to address some of these needs, and I'm pleased to support uh, his amendment. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Indiana, seek Chairman, recognition. Move to strike the last word and simply rise uh, in support of the amendment and join with the comments made by the chairman. And I would yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Missouri. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The clerk will read. Page 6, line 20, expenses, $177,500,000 to remain available until September 30, 2014. 
What purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia. Page 7, line 4, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $5,325,000. Page 7, line 22, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $150,000. Page 13, line 16, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $45,000. Page 16, line 20, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $1,710,000. Page 31, line 23. Chairman, I ask you unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Is there an objection? Suspending of the reading. Objection has been heard. Clerk will read. Page 31, line 23. After the dollar amount, insert reduced by $12 million. Page 47, line 22. After the dollar amount, insert reduced by $2,259,510. Page 48, line 6, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $882,450. Page 48, line 14, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $350,310. Page 48, line 20, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $320,370. Page 49, line 14, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $42,750. Page 49, line 17, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $7,500. Page 50, line 17, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $3,810,840. Page 51, line 20, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $102,000. Page 52, line 6, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $30,000. Page 56, line 24, after the dollar amount, insert increased by $27,036,730. Gentleman from New Jersey reserves a point of order. The gentleman from uh, Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment would reduce the administrative and salaries and expenses accounts in the underlying bill by just 3 percent. It is similar to an amendment that I offered to the Commerce, Justice, and Science Appropriations Bills just a few weeks ago. My message today is the same as it was then. We're in a fiscal emergency, and it is imperative that we work to get spending under control here in Washington, D.C. Over the last two years, the House has voted to reduce our own administrative accounts, our members' represent representational allowances, by over 11%. As we all know, this has resulted in pay freezes and in some cases pay cuts for a number of our own staff members. Yet during this same period of time, many agencies have seen reductions which are much lower than those which we have taken here in the House. Amazingly, some of these agencies funded under this bill have seen large increases in their administrative accounts. For example, under this bill, the Appalachian Regional Commission would receive a 9% increase in its administrative account over the FY11-13 period. Likewise, the salaries and expenses account for the Defense Nuclear Facilities Safety Board would see a 21% increase. But if you think those increases are big, think again. This legislation would provide the Department of Energy's to departmental administration account with a 64 percent increase over two years. Mr. Chairman, I'm not arguing the merits of any of these agencies, but during this fiscal crisis, just 3 percent could yield significant savings, nearly $30 million in the case of agencies funded under this bill. It's time to tighten our belts. I urge support on my amendment. Now yield back to balance my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New Jersey. I move to strike the last word. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise to oppose the amendment, but certainly uh, understand and, and share the passion of the gentleman for reducing federal spending. And, and our bill does plenty of that. Uh, as we went through the process, we did exactly that. Uh, this amendment would cut administrative expenses across the entire bill. Uh, over many months in public hearings, our committee 
in a bipartisan way, has already considered each administrative account separately and have made specific cuts while maintaining oversight to prevent wasteful spending. We've done our job. The gentleman's amendment cuts all administrative accounts indiscriminately without regard to where funds are needed and where cuts are possible. We understand where he's going, but the committee has done its work, and therefore I must strongly oppose his amendment, and I yield back. I continue to reserve my point of order, though. He back his time. He reserves his point of order. The gentleman from Indiana. Chairman, move to respect the last word. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chairman, uh, move uh, to express my uh, strong opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Uh, some would suggest outrage. Uh, I would simply say uh, opposition. Uh, the fact is, uh, across the board cuts to administrative accounts, when we have significant problems as far as the administration of some of these programs in the Department of Energy, is a profound mistake. Uh, and what I really want to emphasize at this point to all of our colleagues in the House uh, is the members of this subcommittee and the full Appropriations Committee in which approved this bill, the people of this committee approved this bill, uh, have made value judgments account by account. Uh, and the fact is, uh, for renewable energy, and we will have amendments on this issue, uh, there is a $428,345,000 reduction in this bill. In the Office of Science, there is a $72,203,000 reduction. Uh, for environmental cleanup, uh, for defense sites, for example, there is an $88,872,000,000 cut. These were all discrete decisions made uh, and value judgments. Uh, so I would emphasize to my colleagues, there are significant cuts and savings in this bill and strongly oppose the gentleman's amendment and would yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, the amendment uh, proposes to, uh, if I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman, the amendment proposes to amend portions of the bill not yet read. The amendment may not be considered and block under Clause 2F of Rule 21 because the amendment proposes to increase the level of new budget authority. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask for a ruling from the chair. Does any member wish to be heard on the point of order? To be considered in bonk pursuant to Section 3J1 of House Resolution 5, an amendment must propose only to transfer appropriations from an object or objects in the bill to a spending reduction account. Because the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia proposes to increase the spending reduction account by more than the amount transferred out of the other accounts, it may not avail itself of Section 3J1 of House Resolution 5 to address the spending reduction account. The amendment is not in order. Clerk will read. Page 7, line 18, Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. $5 million to remain available until September 30th, 2014. Administrative provision, the revolving fund, shall be available during the current year for purchase of passenger motor vehicles. General provisions, Corps of Engineers, Civil, Section 101. None of the funds shall be available through a reprogramming of funds that creates or initiates a new program. Section 102, none of the funds may be used to award any contract that commits fraud, commits funds beyond the amounts appropriated for that program. Section 103, none of the funds may be used to award any continuing contract that commits additional funding for the Inland Water Trust Fund. Section 104, within 120 days of the Chief Engineer's report, the Secretary shall submit the report to the appropriate committees of the Congress. Section 105, the Secretary is authorized to implement measures recommended to prevent aquatic nuisance species from dispersing into the Great Lakes. Section 106, the Secretary of the Army may transfer up to $4,300,000 to mitigate for fisheries loss. 
Section 107. None of the funds shall be available for the Chicago District of the Corps of Engineers to fund any travel outside the district's area of operation. Section 108. Funds provided to the Olmstead Locks and Dam, not more than 50% may be available for obligation until the Corps completes a review of the project. Section 109. Amounts made available by this Act for investigations, construction, and operation and maintenance accounts of the Corps may not be used under the heading additional funding for ongoing work until the report required is submitted. Section 110. None of the Chairman. funds may be used by the Corps of Pur Engineers. Chairman. What purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise to strike the last word because I have an amendment gentleman at the desk. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman, and ask that it be considered as read. It would strike the gentleman section. Will suspend. The gentleman will suspend. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Moran of Virginia. Gentleman's Page recognized. 12, beginning on line 16, strike section 110. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, as the clerk read, this would strike section 110 of this bill. Uh, this is a legislative rider that is bad policy and does not belong in an appropriations bill. This rider, 110, permanently blocks the Army Corps of Engineers from fixing existing policies that are confusing and inconsistent and not working. It risks great harm to fresh sources of drinking water, and it jeopardizes flood protection and outdoor recreation. Specifically, because Section 110 prohibits the Army Corps from clarifying the limits of federal and state authority under the Clean Water Act. Mr. Chairman, two Supreme Court cases over the last decade addressed the scope of the federal government's authority under the Clean Water Act. The Court's rulings did not require less regulation and protections, but urged the Congress and the Executive Branch to provide a sound rationale and consistency to clarify the limits of federal authority. The Corps and the EPA have now issued draft guidance clarifying federal authority that adheres to the Court's rulings. Congress, by contrast, has not. And with this rider, Congress is about to make matters much worse. Worse because blocking completion of the guidance and any subsequent regulations, which the bill's rider would do, will be bad for the public's health, bad for businesses, and bad for farmers. It's especially bad for 117 million Americans whose drinking water comes from headwaters and non-perennial streams. Shouldn't we be concerned about what toxic material is dumped into these streams? It's bad for American businesses who need certainty. Without updated guidances, guidance, businesses will often not know when they need a Corps permit in order to develop land. This uncertainty could subject them to civil and criminal liability and certainly will cost them extra money. It's bad for farmers because this rider eliminates the agricultural exclusion for prior converted cropland that was added to the waters of the United States rule at the farmer's request. Section 110 invalidates all rules issued after the rule dated November 13, 1986, but not until 1993 did the Corps and EPA define the waters of the U.S. to exclude prior converted cropland. Claims that federal guidance and regulations are unnecessary because of state clean water programs are wrong as well. Thirty-three states joined a brief in the most recent of the Supreme Court cases urging the court to uphold federal protections for wetlands adjacent to non-navigable streams. The states noted that federal safeguards were critical because water flows between states, because maintaining a federal floor pollution control creates parity between states, and because states have come to rely on federal protections and would face serious administrative and financial burdens if they were solely responsible for these requirements. Finally, even though the rider may block the guidance clarifying federal and state authority, it does not make the Clean Water Act requirements for a permit go away. States are still required to implement and enforce the law, and dischargers still must obey it. 
Likewise, third parties may still file lawsuits. The real consequence of this rider will be to frustrate the federal government's efforts to explain where state or federal authority under the Clean Water Act ceases to exist. If this rider prevails, more lawsuits will ensue. So I urge my colleagues to vote to strike this rider to bring clarity to a confusing issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I reserve the balance. I may not reserve. I don't general. reserve the balance. And uh, uh, how much time do I have, Mr. Chairman? The gentleman has one minute remaining. One minute. Well, then let me say, Mr. Chairman, uh, 